Daniela. Okay, we'll start with this. In the women's featherweight division, on the heels of news breaking that Amanda Serrano will be unifying titles with Sarah Mafood next month, also set to go down next month, the reigning WBA featherweight champion of Mexico, Erica Cruz, will be returning to action in what will be her first fight of this year. She will be having a rematch with former champion Jelena Marjanovic of Canada. Jelena, who hasn't seen any action at all since their initial meeting last year, whereas Erica, Erica has defended the newly obtained WBA title at least once against her countrywoman, Melissa Esquivel, in a fight that yielded a similar dynamic to a previous fight with Jelena Marjanovic. Erica Cruz is no... She's no finesse fighting kind of fighter. She's a come forward pressure fighter, a brawler, a mauler, a swarmer. The kind of opponent that's a nightmare for an aging fighter, an aging champion like Jelena Marjanovic, because she's gonna make it a physical fight, a rough and tumble fight that'll make that aging fighter feel every day, every week, every month, every camp and every fight. She's the kind of fighter that'll make an aging fighter feel their age. Erica Cruz's form is less than spectacular. There are definitely defensive lapses in judgment there, but that's all a part of the package. She's the kind of fighter that takes chances, takes one to give one because she's confident enough that she can hurt the other girl so long as she gets within proximity of her. Thus, you need a certain level of power. Shortness, reflexes, and timing to catch her on the way in and get her respect. Otherwise, you're in for a long night. And that's what happened to Jelena Marjanovic last year when she was so confronted with Erica Cruz. She couldn't keep her off. She couldn't deal. And being honest with you, the fight was so lopsided, I don't actually see a need for a second one. I don't actually see a need for a rematch, but it's supposed to be underway, set to go down on the undercard of Juan Francisco Estrada's next fight. This fight's supposed to be going down September 3rd, whereas Mafood versus Serrano's supposed to be going down later on next month on the 24th. A lot of featherweight action in the month of September. All the alphabet titles will be up for grabs. In truth, I think Erica Cruz could likely give Amanda Serrano a better fight than Sarah Mafood will because Erica Cruz, she's persistent, more punching power and more toughness, where Sarah, there's a very good chance that Sarah Mafood not only loses the blue belt to Amanda Serrano, there's a good chance she gets stopped. When it comes to Erica Cruz versus Jelena Marjanovic, there's a good chance that Jelena might get stopped also. It's already been a year's time since their initial meeting. They initially fought in April of last year. April of this year has come and gone. They're set to meet next month in September. Jelena Marjanovic, she's not getting any younger. How can she improve? What does she hope to do differently in a second fight? What does she hope to do differently in a rematch when she was essentially outfought and outgunned? There was a time when you could have given Jelena Marjanovic very good odds to be to come forward Mahler like Erica Cruz, but those days have long since passed. Jelena Marjanovic, unfortunately, is not the same fighter that she used to be, and that's not a knock on her. We're all getting older. None of us are getting any younger, faster, or sharper. Jelena, least of all, having not fought in a year's time. She's 40 years old now. What do you expect's gonna happen if she shares the ring with Erica Cruz for a second time? She may receive an even worse beating than she did the first time out. Just giving it to you straight. Erica Cruz is likely going to win that fight and hang on to her WBA title, at which point attention will then turn to Erica facing the winner of Serrano versus Mafood. I think Amanda Serrano is going to win that fight. Now, Erica Cruz must still be a matchroom fighter, as this upcoming show, September 3rd, is a matchroom show. I didn't forget that last year it was announced that Matchroom signed the newly crowned WBA champion, though she's only actually fought once under the Matchroom banner. This will be her second fight as a Matchroom fighter. Is Erica Cruz being a matchroom fighter, could that pose any potential hindrances to 
unifying titles with the winner of Serrano versus Mafood, and I really don't think so because Alicia Baumgartner is a matchroom fighter, but the people at Matchroom and Alicia herself, she still had the liberty to cross over to the Sky Sports and Boxer side of things to unify titles with Michaela Mayer. And I think Erica Cruz has similar autonomy. If she wants an Amanda Serrano fight, and Amanda Serrano fight is on some other side of the street, I don't see her being a matchroom fighter being an issue. I don't see Matchroom or Eddie Hearn getting in the way. I think the real question is, does Erica Cruz actually want that fight? Because so far, this will be her first fight of this year. Before it was announced that Amanda Serrano would be unifying titles with Sarah Mafood, we all know she was supposed to be fighting Brenda Carbajal on the undercard of Jake Paul versus Haseem Rahman. That could have easily been Erica Cruz. Yeah, if she wanted the fight. We all know it's Amanda Serrano's intention to become this division's undisputed champion. So at some point, Amanda's going to come knocking on Erica Cruz's door. And it's really a question of whether or not Erica really wants that fight. It's the best fight to make. After a while, it will be. At featherweight, yeah. No, I don't anticipate Erica being a matchroom fighter posing an issue. But whether or not Erica actually wants the fight, that's the major issue. Because I think Erica's going to beat Jelena Marjanovic. And I think Amanda Serrano's going to beat Sarah Mafood. At which point, Erica and Amanda will be the last two women, last two champions standing in today's super featherweight division. And if Amanda has it her way, there can only be one. And just in keeping with the theme of that story, Juan Francisco Estrada's September return to action. This will be his first fight since his rematch with Chocolatito last year. He's been out of action a while. He was under orders to satisfy his mandatory challenger by way of the WBA, Joshua Franco, and he decided to vacate his title. Juan Francisco Estrada will head home for his first fight after being removed as WBA titleist. BoxingScene.com has learned that the lineal junior bantamweight champion and WBC franchise titleist will next face countryman Argi Cortez atop the September 3rd show from Estriada's hometown of Hermosillo, Sonora, Mexico. The bout was confirmed during the WBC's latest Martes de Café, which translates into screaming zebra testicles. That's not what that means. The card, which will air live on the zone, will also include the long-delayed WBA featherweight rematch between defending titleist Erica Cruz and former long-reigning WBA and WBC champion Jelena Marjanovic. A formal announcement of the entire show is expected in the coming days. Estrada, 42 wins, 3 losses with 28 knockouts, will end an 18th month long absence with the fight, which comes shortly after being relieved of his WBA junior bantamweight title reign for failure to defend against Joshua Franco. 18 wins with 1 loss, 2 draws, 8 knockouts. The title consolidation clash was ordered months ago by the WBA, with Golden Boy Promotions winning the purse bid in hopes of staging the bout on either June 11th or July 16th. Both dates came and went without a fight, as did an extended period of the WBA seeking confirmation from Estriada on his plans to defend. As previously reported by BoxingScene.com, the WBA elected to strip Juan Francisco Estrada, leaving Joshua Franco who previously held a secondary version of the title as the lone 115-pound title holder as recognized by the sanctioning body. The moves made by Estrada were twofold, with the primary intention to move forward with a long-awaited rubber match against legendary former four-division champion Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez. Such about is targeted for December, though no firm confirmation has yet been offered. Cortez, 23 wins, two losses with two draws and ten knockouts, will step up in class for the fight. The 27-year-old from Mexico City has only fought three scheduled 10-round bouts. Mexico City, that's high altitude. That's where Erica Cruz is from. Should we be worried? Well, fighters that hail from high altitude tend to have great gas tanks, great engines, kind of fighters that throw punches in bunches and can do so for the entirety of the match. However, this is a handpick. I haven't had the chance to get a look at Cortez, though I do get the sense that Juan Francisco Estrada and his team must have liked their chances against Cortez a lot more than they like their chances against Franco. Otherwise, they would have just tuned up with Franco if they felt it was going to be an easy night, an easy fight. They must not have. Otherwise, they wouldn't have forfeited the WBA title. They would have had that title to bring into a Chocolatito trilogy. They chose to chuck it. Juan Francisco Estrada did in order to circumvent a Joshua Franco fight, which I think could have perhaps jeopardized a Chocolatito trilogy. They're trying to preserve this guy, ease him back into activity so he can make it 
to that third Chocolatito fight. It's been 18 months since this guy last fought. Plans for Estrada versus Gonzalez 3 were set for last October 16. Estrada made the fight happen by exchanging his physical WBC belt for the franchise title in lieu of a third fight with mandatory challenger Sisrakit Sorung Visay, a former two-time champion who split two fights with Estrada. The rubber match was postponed when Gonzalez tested positive for COVID, the third act. Do you remember what the report were at that time? That in camp, in preparation for the Chocolatito trilogy, Juan Francisco Estrada wasn't performing up to scratch, and post-COVID symptoms were the culprit, were suspected. So you know. Plans for Estrada versus Gonzalez 3 were set for last October 16th. Estrada made the fight happen by exchanging his physical WBC belt for the franchise title in lieu of a third fight with mandatory challenger Sisrakit Sorhung Visay, a former two-time champion who split two fights with Estrada. The rubber match was postponed when Gonzalez tested positive for COVID. The third act was rescheduled for March 5th. This time with Estrada testing positive and shutting down training camp in mid-January. Gonzalez went on to face and beat WBC flyweight Julio Cesar Martinez in a non-title fight. At 115 pounds, the fight was sanctioned by the WBC with the promise of the winner getting a crack at Estrada and his franchise championship. You know, I was actually worried about Chocolatito ahead of that fight. Man alive, did he school that guy. The WBC flyweight champion Julio Cesar Martinez took the fight on short notice and I was actually worried about Chocolatito in that fight. I was worried that Julio Cesar Martinez might arrive at Super Flyweight a little bit more invigorated, not having to cut all the way down to Flyweight, fighting at Super Flyweight instead, and it didn't make the least bit of difference. Chocolatito took that guy to school. He outclassed Julio Cesar Martinez, and that's a part of how we got here. He held up his end of the bargain next month. Juan Francisco Estrada will be tasked to do the same. You know, conflict arose when the WBA, who waited out two postponements, moved forward with its title consolidation plans. Estrada has clearly made his choice, though beforehand comes a rust-shaking bout in his first fight in his hometown since August of 2019 in a win over Dwayne Beeman. I remember that fight. He has since fought in Mexico City and Dallas, with injuries and illness slowing down his career, though now back at full health. I think the judges were rather generous they were. to Juan Francisco Estrada in that second Chocolatito fight last year. He didn't deserve that decision, in my opinion. It's unfortunate that Juan isn't bringing an alphabet title for Chocolatito to win, should he win this third fight, this trilogy. The most he can stand to gain is a WBC franchise title that could, in theory, line him up for this division's WBC world champion, Bam Rodriguez, except Chocolatito has already made it clear he has no intentions to fight Bam Rodriguez. They're like family. We talked about that in my previous video. Thus, if he were to beat Juan Francisco Estrada and take his franchise status from him, it really wouldn't be worth much. I mean, the real appeal here is revenge. Revenge for a decision that he should have got in their second meeting, in their second fight last year. But Juan Francisco Estrada's got to make it there. He's got to hold up his end of the bargain against Cortez next month. Which means I'm going to have to review some footage, give Cortez a look, get a look at what the hell we're dealing with here, and whether or not Juan can actually make it to that Chocolatito trilogy later on this year. He screws the pooch in September. You can kiss that trilogy goodbye in December. And finally, in men's heavyweight news, Malik Scotch posted this image via his Instagram account with a caption that reads, Preparation in Motion, October 15th. Seen here, both Malik Scotch and his old buddy, former WBC heavyweight champion, Deontay Valder. We already know that Deontay Valder is tabbed for a fall return in October. Are we to assume that this is the proposed date? The working date for his ring return. Well, that is a Saturday night. There's a lot of talk about who it is Deontay Wilde is going to be fighting. But I said it before and I'll say it again. Who he ends up fighting really isn't important. Whether it's Robert Hellenius or someone else. It could be Robert Hellenius. It could be Ali Demarezin. Oh. The real selling point, the real sizzle, the real appeal of this proposed pay-per-view that's rumored to be a Fox pay-per-view as opposed to a Showtime pay-per-view. The real appeal is seeing Deontay Wilder return to action. The real intrigue is seeing what he's got left, seeing if he can pick himself back up. The WBC still has this guy ranked at number one, though if Anthony Joshua falters this weekend, 
and Oleksandr Yusik goes into an undisputed title tilt with Tyson Fury. I don't think Deontay Wilde is going to stay on that WBC route. I don't think he's going to pursue an undisputed title fight. I don't because... Tyson Fury still has a WBC title. I don't think Deontay Wilder wants to get smacked around by that guy anymore. And Usyk, I don't think the Wilder people see the value in taking on Oleksandr Usyk. Now, I think that if Anthony Joshua falters this weekend, they're still going to ride that wave. They're still going to talk up that fight with no real intention of pursuing it. As it still has the same issues now that it had before. Network issues, platform issues, promotional issues. It's the same as it always was. It's the same as before. Eddie Hearn revealed. He actually reached out to Deontay Wilder's co-manager Shelly Finkel recently, but got no reply. Asked about a potential Joshua fight, Hearn said, I have got so much money for Wilder in an offer, but they never come back to me. Whether Anthony Joshua wins this weekend or he loses this weekend, you can expect Finkel and co. to do the same thing they were doing before. They're going to name drop this guy. They're going to talk about this guy. They're going to talk about this fight with no actual intention of pursuing it because what they're not going to do is send Deontay over to DAZN. Don't forget, Anthony Joshua signed a deal to where beyond this weekend's fight, he's going to fight exclusively on the DAZN platform. Do you remember that announcement from a few weeks ago? That deal kicks off beyond this weekend's fight. So whether Anthony Joshua wins this weekend or he loses this weekend, we already know what to expect because we've seen it before. And the issues that hindered the fight before... They're still there now. Missed calls and unanswered emails. Left unread. It's not like Finkel and co. have a great working relationship with Eddie Hearn and the people over there at Matchroom. They don't. Wilder's supposed to be coming back in the fall. If he makes it through that fight... What likely follows is an Andy Ruiz showdown next year, provided that Andy makes it past Luis Ortiz. If he doesn't, well, things get a little bit more dicey. Deontay Wilder is still one of the PBC's top draws. One of their top sellers. One of the few guys they've got in their stable that moves the needle, at least a little bit. Do you remember a few weeks ago when news broke that Derek Chisora made Adam Kovnowski an offer, a seven-figure offer, to box him, headline a show with him? They still didn't let Adam Kovnowski bite. They still didn't let Adam Kovnowski cross the street. They instead put him in an Ali Dimerezin fight that was not a seven-figure fight. Hell, it wasn't even a main event. So you think they're going to send Wilder over there? No fucking way. Or maybe if it were a joint pay-per-view between either Fox and DAZN or Showtime and DAZN, yeah, maybe you could work something out that way, but I don't think they want to split the pot with the people over there at DAZN. With Anthony Joshua set to box exclusively on DAZN, whether he wins or loses this weekend... We really are right back where we started. It's like we never left. It's like nothing changed. Eddie Hearn reaching out to Wilder's people to open up a dialogue, and Wilder's people not answering calls, not responding to emails, not playing ball. It's like 2018 all over again, and I'm not surprised because I told you. The same issues that were there before, they're still there now.